If you've been playing Overwatch for a while, you've probably heard advice like take off angles or use the high ground or maybe even utilize flanking. These terms get thrown around so much that they might not even mean anything to you anymore. Like what's a good off angle? What characters want to use high ground? When should I be flanking? All of these questions have a lot of nuance and misusing these tools can actually be detrimental to your gameplay, which is why today I'm going to explain each of these three concepts in detail, followed by showing you in-game examples of how to utilize them so you can take your gameplay to the next level. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Let's start with off angles. What someone means when they refer to an off angle is any angle that you play from that isn't with the main body of your team. Usually the main body of your team is centered around your tank, so anytime you're shooting at the enemy from a different position than your tank, you're on an off angle. Because of this, both high grounds and flanks can be considered an off angle, but an off angle is not always considered high ground or flank. Similar to how a square is always a rectangle, but a rectangle is not always a square. Okay, so now that you understand what an off angle is, let's talk about why they're so strong and why good players use them every game. The main advantage that off angles give you is the ability to split the enemy's attention. When you're playing in a different position than the rest of your team, there are now two threat areas that the enemy must pay attention to, the main body of your team and you. Because of this, they have to decide how to divert resources towards each and find good positioning to mitigate both points of threat. This is inherently more difficult than just playing against one position. Let's provide an example. You are playing Ana, and your team is defending the point on Oasis Gardens. The enemy is pushing you from main, and because they're all grouped up, it's very easy to use cover to avoid dying and defend from the point. But all of a sudden, while their tank pushes down main, soldiers start shooting you from hookah. All of a sudden, you can no longer contribute resources to the fight in main, because if you don't respond to the soldier, you're going to die. You can either quickly start firing back, but he's already got the jump on you, so that's not really your best option. You decide to get to cover, likely using at least one cooldown in the process. Even though Soldier probably didn't kill you from his off angle, he forced out your cooldowns and diverted your attention for a second or two, which could lead to your tank losing support in main and dying. Best case, your tank lives but has to use their mitigation cooldowns due to the sudden lack of support and loses their advantage in the fight. Worst case, you didn't have any cooldowns and cover was too far away and you get picked at the start of the fight, leading to a teamfight loss. This is the power of off angling. When you force the enemy to deal with multiple threats at once, they are much more prone to making mistakes that lead to you winning the fight. The longer you can hold an off angle, the better your odds are to win that fight. Usually, enemies will prioritize pressuring you out of your position because they know if they don't, they're going to lose. Because of that, a good off angle is one where you have reliable cover that you can duck behind and get healed before returning and applying more pressure. Okay, so now you know what an off angle is and why it's so strong. Let's talk about who likes to use them. I'm going to split the roster up into three categories. Heroes that love off angles, heroes who use them if they can afford to, and heroes who really don't care about them. You'll notice almost every single damage character in the game likes to use off angles, although some are better at it than others. Mid to long range hit scan like Ash, Soldier, and Sojourn make the best use out of them, along with characters with high mobility or self sustain like Echo, Tracer, and Farah. DPS like Cassidy, Bastion, and Torb are a bit more situational. While off angling is still good, these characters have low mobility and self sustain, so you have to make sure you have enough support to not die when you use that off angle. There are also DPS like Sim or Mei who like off angling when they can but also they really like to bully the tank from main, so they won't always try and find an off angle. Most of the characters who don't care about off angling at all are tanks, especially the brawly archetype, and support two aren't as focused on damage as they are supporting, like Life Weaver or Mercy. The last thing to cover before we move on to high ground is when and how to use off angles. And I say this for last because it's the trickiest. If you're playing a character who always benefits from off angling, then you would think you should just always be on an off angle, right? But as I mentioned before, playing away from your team comes with some downsides. It's easier to get isolated by the enemy, and it's harder for your teammates to support you. If you're trying to off angle and constantly getting dove by multiple players, sometimes it's better to just stick with your team. Honestly, it's very situational, and I encourage you to think about some scenarios in which you should or shouldn't take advantage of off angles. The win is the hardest part, and once you figure that out, the how is very easy. You just apply consistent pressure as much as possible and draw attention to yourself without dying. Even if two to three people turn to you and force you out, that means the rest of your team is in a temporary 4v3 or 4v2 and can take space and generally push the enemy around. If they don't look at you, then you can farm them for free and provide huge value every fight. I'll provide some real in-game examples at the end of this video to help out a little bit with what that looks like. If you want more personalized coaching revolving around this, you can find me doing free live VOD reviews every Sunday from 1 to 4 p.m. CST on my Twitch, which will be linked down in the description below. So at this point in the video, hopefully you're convinced that all things are worth using and it's time to move on to high ground. I'm not going to go too in depth on defining high ground as I feel like it's, well, pretty self-explanatory. Let's move straight into what makes it strong and worth using. First off, and maybe the most obvious advantage to high ground is that you're much harder to get to. Instead of the enemy being able to just walk you down, they now have to either spend extra time taking the stairs or use a mobility cooldown just to get to your location. 
This can easily put you at a resource advantage as while they walk up to you, they'll be getting shot at and potentially using more cooldowns to survive. Secondly, if they do come up and challenge you and things get hairy, you have a very easy escape just by dropping down. Thirdly, if they decide to just fight you from the low ground instead, you automatically have the cover advantage because at any point you can just back up and cut off their line of sight of you. There are some other benefits as well. When you're on the high ground, a higher percentage of their visible hitbox will be their head because you're on a top down view. So while your overall accuracy may drop a little bit due to the unfamiliarity of vertical aiming, your headshot percentage will naturally rise which helps to get quicker kills. On top of all of that, high ground will usually be an off angle. Aside from certain points like Gibraltar 2nd or Numbani 1st, your tank is usually going to anchor low ground with the objective and that means you can get a different angle on the enemy than the rest of your team. This retains all the same benefits we talked about before with off angles. You split the enemy's attention and allow them space to make more mistakes. I won't spend as much time talking about high ground as I did with off angles, but I will still talk about when you want to use high ground. Unlike off angles, which can be found on just about every map ever, some maps and points will have better high grounds than others. There are high grounds in the game that are just not useful. It's usually evident though. If you're far away from your team and don't have good lines of sight on the enemy, then don't use that high ground. Most useful positions will be easy to spot and commonly used, like the gas station on Route 66 first point, the two ledges overlooking King's Row third point, or the window on Shambhali Monastery second point. Timing is also an important factor to the when should I use high ground question. Sometimes you'll be in a good position but your team isn't set up and ready to fight, so it won't be good use and you could get picked early. Make sure that you're not the only one from your team shooting the enemy, otherwise you're no longer on an off angle since you're not splitting anyone's attention. The last major category we're going to get into is flanking, which brings with it a lot more nuance than off angling. If you flank on the wrong character or at the wrong time, you'll be doing something we refer to around here as feeding, which can not only lose you the fight, but it can also make your team very upset at you and overall bring down the mentality. Technically, flanking is just the most extreme form of off angling. You engage the enemy from behind, forcing the enemy to choose to either fight you or your team. Unlike off angling, where you can sometimes just ignore them with good positioning, you can't really ignore a flanker or you're going to die. This means if you time your flank correctly, you can get value just by taking the player you are fighting out of the main brawl. If you're dueling an Ana as a tracer, every second you prolong that duel is a second where she isn't pumping heals into her tank. Every cooldown you extract from her is a cooldown that your team no longer has to deal with. This is one of the things that makes flanking such a strong tool to have in your arsenal. So, how exactly do you time a flank? How do you set up properly? Who should you be targeting? Well, slow down, I'm going to cover all those things, but first I want to talk about which characters should be flanking to begin with. I'm only going to include DPS this time, as although some supports and maybe a tank or two can make it work, it's almost always niche and not a regular occurrence for them. The best flankers are going to be characters with high mobility like Tracer, a reliable escape like Reaper, or hard to confirm but high burst damage like Farah or Echo. Keep in mind that flanking will always work best the first time you do it, especially on characters who are not known for flanking. One of the biggest mistakes in low elo is being very predictable with your flanks. If the enemy knows you're behind them, they can easily turn around and isolate you in a 1v5, and at that point you're throwing your own game. However, if they don't know you're there, you can essentially get free kills once the fight starts because everyone's back is turned to you. I want to briefly make a few notes about some characters on this list. Pre-season 9, you may have heard the advice that Junkrat would be a good flanker, which was true then but is no longer the case now since he has no one-shot combo. Flanking to use Riptire can sometimes net you a multi-kill, but good teams will often hunt down your body if you're behind them, so use this tactic wisely. With High Noon and Visor, I usually advise against flanking when you use them, but if you want to be flashy and pull it off, make sure you're tracking certain cooldowns and ults like Honestsleep, Bap Lamp, Eva Matrix, Lucio Beat, or anything else that can shut down your value. If you're behind them when they use these cooldowns, they'll likely be able to kill you for free along with denying value from your ult since your team won't be there to support you. Okay, easy stuff aside, let's get into the meat of the section. When to flank, how to set up, and who to target. Who to target's easy, so let's get that out of the way first. The priority list is something as follows. Low targets who we can quickly and safely secure kill on. Isolated targets with no teammates nearby. Immobile targets who can't get away from us and if none of those exist, just go for a support. Let's do a couple quick quizzes to make sure you understand. We're on Dorado first point, and you've snuck behind the enemy on Sombra. Which enemy do you go for in this situation? The correct answer is Ash, since she's isolated, despite the fact that she has mobility and Baptiste doesn't. Let's make it a bit harder. We're playing Tracer on Legion Control Center, and Lucio's 20 HP in the middle of their team. The Kiriko just suzu their tank and teleported back to Junkrat, leaving her with no cooldowns. Who can we go for in this situation? It's a bit tricky since I didn't tell you what cooldowns we have. If we have recall, we can safely blink past the Kiriko and finish the Lucio knowing we'll have recall to get out if things go south. However, if we do not have recall in this situation, 
it would be more reliable to distract the Kiriko and Junkrat, which can leave our team in a 4v3 while the enemy tank is only receiving healing from his Lucio. These are the sort of things you want to think about while flanking, but I think you get the idea now, so let's move on. Next is the setup. I like to split the setup into two different categories in my mind. Expected flanks versus surprise flanks. A surprise flank sounds like what you might expect. You're hiding from the enemy and plan to surprise them to get quick kills before they can react and get to cover or kill you. This is commonly seen working in the metal ranks with flank ults like Barrage or High Noon, whereas an expected flank is one where the enemy knows or expects it's coming, like when you blink behind them on Tracer and they can hear you. You want to identify which type of flank you're going for before setting up for it. If you're on Tracer or Sombra, it's almost always going to be an expected flank. Scout beforehand, poke if you can, and engage when the timing's right, which is something we're going to talk about in the next section. If you're playing Reaper or Farah and looking for a big ult, you want to hide where the enemy can't easily see you, wait for key cooldowns like Honest Sleep or Arisa Spear, and then pop out and kill their whole team before they realize what happened. If you get spotted before your big moment, don't be afraid to disengage and make a change of plans. Surprise flanks work best the first time, and after that they're going to be ready and expecting it, so don't overuse them in the same game. Okay, so you're set up and ready to go now, but you have to figure out when your moment to shine is. Timing is probably the most important component of pulling off a successful flank. We've all had the teammate before who continuously dies while we're all still walking back from spawn, or the one who's in the backline 24-7 but seemingly never doing anything. If I just described you, listen up, because I'm about to give you a simple rule to follow that will fix 90% of your timing issues. Before you engage, I want you to ask yourself, is my tank actively fighting anybody yet? If the answer is yes, you can engage. If the answer is no, consider waiting until the answer is yes before going in. There are a few notable exceptions to this, like if a target's truly isolated and you want to take a 1v1 with them before they regroup with their team, then go ahead and do so. Or if you notice that their supports used a key cooldown and you want to take advantage of the downtime before they're going to have it back again. But in general, you don't want to engage if no one else on your team is fighting yet. If you do engage right when your team starts fighting, you should be focusing on distracting and surviving as long as possible. At this point in the fight, the enemy should have most of their cooldowns still up and ready to deal with you, so plan accordingly. If you find a flank later in the fight, you're usually going to have a better chance of picking up kills as the enemy will have less resources to deal with you and more already going on to pay attention to. Neither choice is wrong as long as you're anticipating the situation and reacting correctly. Congratulations! You're now an expert on all things concerning off angles, high grounds, and blinking, and it's time to get into the gameplay examples to cement the knowledge you've learned. But before that, consider leaving a like on the video if you've learned something so far. If this video gets 100 likes, I'm going to make a guide showing the best high grounds and off angles on every point in the game so you know exactly where to play to give yourself the greatest chance of winning. With that out of the way, let's get into the gameplay. In this game, we had been fighting at the entrance to point for a long time and had been making no progress, so I looked for a different angle. I could hear their sojourn on my right and decided I could take the 1v1 since I had the element of surprise on my side. After winning this position, the enemy now has no good way to avoid both me and my team, so I use High Noon to force them into my team or get a kill. The fight continues on from there and I don't really have to do too much anymore, just me existing on this angle makes their life difficult and I'm focused on not dying since my supports aren't really with me anymore. In the next example, I'm playing Ash against Mephara. It's important to note that you don't always have to be fragging to get value from good positioning. Just by standing where I am and putting pressure on the Fara, she can't fly in open space anymore and has to use cover or die. This positioning is a little scary for me since I don't have any cover, so in this specific case, I shouldn't be scoping in as much as I am in order to avoid more Helix Rockets or Fara's primary fire. They end up pushing on with Kitsune, but look at the angles I have on the enemy team while they walk on. I end up dropping due to multiple people shooting me at once, but I now have an easy reposition on my left to continue helping my team, or I can take a riskier off angle on my right if I believe I can live there. Lastly, I want to show you both an expected flank and a surprise flank. I'm going to show you examples with Reaper, since that's the character I know how to play best, but this same concept can apply to Tracer, Sombra, Genji, and many more DPS. I try to just walk up at first while saving my fade as an escape, but Sojourn's still with the Ana, so I disengage after getting sleep out. I'm looking for an opportunity to get back on the Ana, but I want to have my fade first. At this point, she knows I'm coming for her, which is why it's expected, but I know she doesn't have sleep or nade, so I'm just wasting her time and preventing her from helping her team on the point. She hits a nice sleep on me, but her Sojourn and JQ died since she couldn't heal them, and we wrap up the fight and get the win. The last thing I'll be showing you guys today is a surprise flank. A huge component of a successful surprise flank is timing, so use sound cues to try and tell when you can go in. One of the things I like to listen for is key support cooldowns like Sleep or Suzu. Notice how when I come out here, the enemy's in the middle of a fight already. They know what's coming, but they can't really do anything about it. Unfortunately, my Farah had the same idea as I did, but either one of us would have gotten the team kill there. That's all I've got for today. If you have something to share about any of these topics that I missed, be sure to leave a comment down below. 
My goal is to educate my community and help everyone become the best Overwatch player they can be, and the more people that want to be a part of that mission with me, the better. I hope you enjoyed, but more importantly, I hope you learned something today. See you in the next one.